Well, like I said earlier, uh, good morning. So glad to have you with our space. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to just kind of briefly mention uh, the, the all night uh, prayer room. I don't know if um, how many of you did that last year. We, we or last time that we did it, we had a, a pretty good group of you all who've done it. And uh, if that's not something that you've done before and you're kind of intimidated by this idea of uh, staying up all night and, and or at least a, a few hours during the night, uh, I just want to encourage you. It's, it's by far uh, one of the most um, in, in kind of all the years of ministry that, that I've been a part of, it's been kind of something that's been incredibly uh, shaping experience. And so if you're nervous in any type of way, uh, sign up, like do the 10 o'clock hour or the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, you don't have to dive into the 3 a.m. hour. You know, I'll be there at 3 a.m. So if, if there's some 3 a.m. people, uh, we'll, we can be there together. Uh, but don't feel intimidated that you need to kind of dive into that, that middle hour, do a 10 o'clock or maybe even a 6 a.m. Uh, hour and, and just try it just try it for the first time. It's, it's an incredible thing to have a little bit of space of, of um, where there's no distractions in a period where there's all kinds of distractions. Uh, just that we want to create that environment that really uh, does that for you. And so I just want to encourage you, you can go to GC Events. Um, GCEvents.Boston to sign up for that and we'd love to, to see you there. Okay, um, we're in a series that we started last week. Um, should I change my mic? It's like super, can you hear that out there? Anybody? I could push through it and it would just be super distracting and, and weird for me. Should I just keep going? We're good? Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, we're in a series called The Dwelling Place. See this? Mo- we're just having a moment right now. We're just like a family here. Um, we're in a series called The Dwelling Place of God. And we're looking, so here's what we've been doing. Over the last, uh, last week, we kind of began into this thought or this idea, really a kind of a ludicrous idea, that if you read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, what you'll find is this really ridiculous idea that God, the creator in heaven, uh, wants to uh, not only uh, be committed to a plan, but he also wants to be committed to a people. And so when you begin in Genesis all the way through Revelation, what you find out is over and over and over and over again, and we'll look at it in a moment why it's a, a really a kind of ludicrous thing or thought or idea, what you'll see over and over and over again is God saying to a people, I want to be in your presence. I want you in my presence. I want to, uh, the Hebrew word for dwell, which is kind of the word that we're gathering around for this series, Uh, literally means to take up residence with. And so God is saying to the Israelites and and, and others in the Old Testament, and then fast forward to the New Testament, in various types of ways, and this is what we're looking at over the next few weeks together, he's essentially saying to them, I want to take up residence with you. I want to bless you with my presence. I I want to honor you uh, with who I am. And so we've been rolling... Uh, through this, uh, this idea. And so last week we looked at the Genesis story, uh, the creation story, and, and we basically see that God's motivation for creating in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, his, his core motivation is love. And so we are sitting in this room, we're here today because we're a product of his love. He didn't create us because he needed, you know, more workers. He wasn't bored. He didn't need entertainment. God created as an, out of an overflow of the love relationship that we see between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And so the motivating for the dwelling of God in week one, the motivating kind of distinctive factor is the love of God. And so what we want to do this morning is we want to look at kind of a, a second story and kind of uh, get our mind er around this idea of dwelling place. Here's what we're gonna do just straight up from the series, just just so you you know. We we wanna identify these various places. So the creation story, we're looking at Mount, kind of wilderness Mount Sinai today. We'll look at the tabernacle, we'll look at the temple, we'll look at Jesus, uh, the church, uh, Revelation at the end. Uh, But just straight up on the, the front end, we want to highlight these things because we want to become a people who prioritize the presence of God. That's like what we're after. And so we can read these things and kind of go, oh, that's really fascinating, that's really interesting that God would show up that way, and oh, there's some stuff there that we can kind of take away in the temple and in the, at Mount Sinai and, and through, G- you know, we, we kind of look at all these things and, and we don't simply just want to look at them from a intellectual level. We want you to look at them and go, I need to prioritize the presence of God in my life. That's the goal, straight up. There's, there's kind of no hiding around it. We want to get Psalm 26, 8 into our bodies. The psalmist says this, Lord, 
I love the house where you dwell, the place where your glory resides. That's it. We, we want to be a people who just say, God, I love the house that you dwell in. I, I just want to be close to it. I, I want to be just, if, just a doorkeeper in your place. Okay, so the second significant place that we see God seeks to dwell uh, happens in the uh, wilderness. And so God has led them out of Egypt and now into the wilderness. So we're going to be in Exodus uh, 33. And so we'll pick it up um, in verse uh, 1, and we'll do 1 through 11. But let me pray for us, and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you for your scriptures. Uh, we need your help this morning understanding these things. God, we invite your Holy Spirit uh, into this space uh, as a way to um, bring to light the things that perhaps we would miss, uh, both on purpose or, or maybe on purpose. Uh, we, we tend to push against things that you're calling us into. And, and so we, we want your help. We need your help in seeing this, Father. And so we would just ask that during this time uh, you would guide us, Father, bring about conviction or encouragement, clarity, wherever, whatever is needed this morning, God, you know how to minister to us individually and corporately. And so we, we just invite you. We say we want that this morning. We pray that in Christ's name. Amen. All right, it says, verse 1, Exodus 33. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, uh, Go up from here, you and your people. Uh, go up from here, you and the people you brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your offspring. Okay, so they've come out of Egypt, and now they're progressing towards a land that God has said he's promised to give them, right? This is where we're at. Verse 2, he says, I'll send an angel ahead of you. He'll drive out Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, all the ites, right? He says, all these people, I'm going I'm, I'm to drive all of these people out in front of you. They're not going to be there. Verse 3. It says, go up to the land. Here's a description of the land. It says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, second part of verse 3 is where I want to draw our attention uh, just in, in this moment, and we'll flesh it out for a bit. So it says, I want you to go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up with you. Now, he's going to give the reason why he's not going to go up with you. He says, because you are a stiff-necked people, otherwise I might destroy you on the way. Verse 4. Uh, when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and they didn't put on their jewelry. Now, we're going to get in verse 5, kind of a summary of, um, it's kind of a, a builder on of what we just saw in 1 through 4. It says, the, uh, For the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites, uh, you are a stiff-necked people. If I went up with you for a single moment, I would destroy you. God, God basically says, I'm not going to go with you because I'm concerned I will kill you. Right? He's like, I'm not sure that I trust myself to not destroy you. And so I'm going to send you out, but I'm not going with you to the land. I'm going to send an angel. They're going to clear the land for you, but I'm not going to uh, go with you. And it says, now take off your jewelry and I'll decide what to do with you. Verse 6, it says, so the Israelites uh, remained, uh, stripped their jewelry uh, at Mount Horeb and onward. Verse 7 now Moses took a tent and pitched it outside the camp, and in a distance from the camp he called the tent of meeting. Some strong dwelling vibes right there, right? It says anyone who wanted to consult uh, the Lord would go to the tent of meeting that was outside the camp. Uh, whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would stand up, each one at the door of his tent. They would watch Moses until he entered the tent. When Moses entered the tent, this is remarkable, when Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud, we'll look at that in a moment, would come down and remain at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. All the people saw the pillar of cloud remaining at the entrance of the tent. They would stand up, they would bow and worship each one at the own door of his tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses face to face just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. His assistant, though, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. Okay, so this pillar of cloud, this is called the Shekinah glory. This is what we see in the Old Testament. It's a different type of, of manifestation of God than what we see in the New Testament, which is what we see through uh, Jesus, um, who uh, is considered the quality of God, not something to be 
grasp, but we see this in Exodus 13, verse 21, Exodus 13, 21, 22, we get an idea of what this pillar of cloud situation is. It says the Lord went ahead of them. This is when they were leaving Egypt. It says the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to lead them on their way during uh, the day. And you're like, that's great. What about at night? What says in a pillar of fire to give them light at night so that they could travel day or night. So it says the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night never left its place in front of the people. I mean, goodness. It says that the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God, when they're leading, they're leaving Egypt, is leading out in front of them. And it's a pillar of cloud by day. So they're seeing the cloud, they're following it. And then it's nighttime and God's like, let me give you a little light. It says it becomes a pillar of fire by night. And so they're seeing the manifest presence of God as they're leaving Egypt in front of them leading the way. There's no question about what's happening in this moment. There's no question about who's leading them. Uh, it's, it is God. Now, what happens here, here, here's the problem that we pick up in Exodus 33. Uh, and this is a problem for much of the Bible. The, the problem is we have a holy and perfect God who desires to dwell with the people. Now, that's not so much the problem. It's not the holy, just God. The problem is the people. And the people, over and over and over again, are a rebellious uh, people. It's why we say it's ridiculous that God would seek to dwell with us. Uh, because you know you, and I know me. And if we were honest, we would say, that's ridiculous. That you would seek to want to dwell with me and make your presence known with me. And so in this instance, God specifically calls them a stiff-necked people. Burn. Burn right? Stiff-necked people. Now, what does it mean to be a stiff-necked people? Well, it was a reference that the Israelites would have understood at this time. It is a reference to a, a domestic animal that they would use primarily for plowing. This would be an ox. And so if you were plowing, I'll, I know most of you know, but let me give you a description of how this works. So when, you're, when you would be plowing, right, you would have uh, ox that's necessary. And so you would have ox in front of you, and in one hand they would be holding uh, the, the kind of the, the reins to kind of control the ox, and in the other hand they would be holding uh, uh, basically a stick that had some kind of sharp ends on it that would kind of encourage the animal along. Do you know what I mean? And it had feathers on the end. And so they would, uh, they would kind of hit the animal as necessary on the legs, or they would hit the animal on the, the neck to kind of keep its direction in the path that they want it to go in, right? We have power steering, they have a stick. This is how it works. And if you had an ox that had a, was a, refused to listen to the one directing the plow uh, in fighting back against the leadership of the one leading the plow, you would call the ox stiffed necked. It simply meant a refusal to be led, a stubbornness. And, and so what we're talking about this morning, if, if we're talking about, if love was the motivating factor in Genesis chapter 3 of last week, the highlight that we want to pull out this week is God's leadership. And we want to see his leadership work itself out in the wilderness story. And so God says to the Israelites, I'm not going with you because you refuse my leadership over and over and over again. Uh, you're, you're, you're not wanting it. Um, now, we, we know this uh, because in the, the chapter for this, in Exodus 32, it says that Moses goes up to see God. Uh, he's, out, he's on Mount Sinai. God comes down. He gives him his presence. He says to him, hey, I'm going to give you some uh, directions on, on what to do. These have come to be known as the Ten Commandments. And so uh, while Moses and God are up there on the mountain, uh, the people get a little impatient, if you will. Uh, they begin to kind of question, I don't know, is Moses coming back down? Is he not coming back down? We're kind of unsure what's going on. And uh, in that time period of when Moses is up there, they create a golden calf. We don't have, we don't have um, time to get in, into all of it. But uh, essentially, they don't believe that the golden calf, um, they don't like literally believe this golden calf was a pagan God who led them out. What they're seeking to do is have a physical presence of a God that they do not understand. Right? And so God says, Moses, my boy, um, Exodus 32, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once for your people who you brought out from the land of Egypt have acted corruptly. Now, your people is like a statement when a parent says to another parent, your boy is acting a fool today, right? 
anytime a parent says that to another parent and it's the same person's kid, that's a problem, right? You'll never believe what your boy did today. You're like, oh, this is not going to be good. And so God says, your people have acted corruptly. And if you read Exodus 32, uh, God is going to destroy them. And it's just a little bit of a side note here. It's fascinating how one single sinful act almost uh, unravels the preceding 31 chapters. The Exodus, the plagues, the splitting of the Red Sea. One single sinful act almost unravels the whole thing. And, and I think if we could kind of revi- like remove the veil this morning, I think all of us would recognize the unbelievable pain and destruction one sin can bring. It's not harmless, right? It can unravel many, many things. And so this is what we see playing out in Exodus uh, 32. And so at the end of the, at the, end of the day, uh, they had a problem with following God's leadership, which quite frankly is a bit crazy because God's been leading them faithfully through a, a lot of different things. Now, right. Now, we could read this and go, God, Israelites, this is unbelievable. Uh, why wouldn't you, you, his Shekinah glory has been in front of you, pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. How in the world could you not follow his leadership? Like he's been faithful to you and you've seen his faithfulness. Yeah, it's been difficult, it's been hard, it's been challenging, all these types of things. Why We could take a posture of judgment, but I would venture to guess, I've been following the Lord, uh, I became a Christian when I was 15. So 25 years now, I've been following Jesus. And I've seen him be faithful in 25 years of, of walking with him. It's not been easy, lots of challenging things. It's been really wonderful as well. And so I know that he's faithful. I know that I can trust his leadership. And yet, at moments, I still find myself pushing back against his leadership in my life. Still. Even with his track record. I would venture to guess, if I pressed in hard enough on your life, and you're one who follows the way of Christ, the way of Jesus, you would say the same thing. And so they're kind of following, in, in many ways, the, the way in which we seek to, to follow in and, and not trusting the leadership of God. Now, what are a couple, um, so before we get into the, the kind of the meat of the, the scripture here, uh, what are some barriers to God's leadership in our life? Because they've got some stuff in front of them that's causing them to push back. Uh, just three things quickly that I, I've, I've tended to find are barriers when it comes to trusting the leadership of God uh, in my life is three things. It's our circumstances, our desires, and our expectations. You could almost classify any type of, of like rebellion that may exist in your life, um, any area in which maybe God's been calling, he's been practicing his leadership or seeking to practice his leadership in your life. You could probably classify one reason why you're not doing that in one of these three categories. First one, circumstances. Uh, they're, they're in the wilderness, right? And they're looking around and they're going, I, I don't see a land flowing with milk and honey. And, and because of their circumstances, they've now determined that God cannot be trusted. This, his leadership cannot be trusted. And we're, we're the same way. It could be uh, financial burdens. You've said, uh, man, I, I, like, there's too much stuff going on. God doesn't understand it. It could be that you're, you're here and you're still single. And so it's time to take your, uh, your, time to take your kind of dating status in your own hands, which means you uh, are, are probably giving up more than you should when it comes to relationships. Maybe it's through the loss of someone that you love. It could be a timing issue, whatever it is. And you just said, hey, because of my circumstances, I refuse to follow the leadership of God in my life. It, it could be uh, desires, right? They wanted a God who they kind of fully uh, understood. They wanted this to kind of quickly move around. And so maybe it's your desires that keeps you from pushing into the leadership of God. It could be something as simple as comfort, How many of us refuse to follow the leadership of God, not because of some mass, awful, terrible sin, but just simply because we want to be comfortable? We don't want to be be discomforted, right? We we, we don't want to be inconvenienced. So it could be comfort. It could be uh, sexual desires. All of these types of things. It could be a status. You're trying to get a certain status. So you need to to shortcut where you're trying to get to by bypassing the leadership of God. 
So it could be your desires, it could be expectations. Uh, they left Egypt, it hasn't quite panned out the way that they thought. Maybe the career has stalled, maybe the degree didn't do it. The fulfillment, whatever that fulfillment of, of whatever it was for you, it just didn't do it for you. And so your expectations are keeping you uh, from following God. And so the question this morning is, where have you pushed against the leadership presence of God in your life? Where, where have you kind of said to him, no thanks? I'll, I'll take this part. I'll give you this, I'll give you this, I'll give you this, but you can't, don't mess with my money, don't mess with my relationships, don't mess with my ways of thinking, don't mess with my education, don't, don't mess with whatever. One question I've been thinking about a lot in terms of God's leadership, and maybe someone will find this beneficial, is this question in, in my own life. Um, what's permissible, permissible, like what's allowable to do as God's people, but not beneficial? Like this is spiritual maturity, this right here. Because as you mature in your relationship with Jesus, you, you kind of begin to... Um, push away from the things, David talked about this a few weeks ago, but you begin to push away from the things that are just like explicitly wrong. You know that they're wrong. Like you just, ideally, you just, you, you understand that. It's, it's kind of laid out, it's clear that they're wrong. But as you mature and grow in your faith in the way of Jesus, you begin asking the question, what am I allowed to do but it's not beneficial for me to do? And where, God, where is God calling you in his leadership to walk away from something that you're totally allowed to do, but you know it's not beneficial in this period of your life. And it could just be just for now, right? Where, where God says, just, just for now. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna press in deep. I want you to experience my presence. This thing is not wrong in and of itself, but it's getting in the way. All right, how are we feeling? We good, we good, all right. So God says, I'm not going with you. And God will not bless, I just want to, God will not bless a life that is characterized by self-importance and self-direction. He, he won't do it. And God says, so I'm not going to go with you. And, and he, he just says, apparently you don't want me anyways. This is what we're seeing in the text. And, and honestly, you know what the worst thing is? You, you know what the worst thing God could do for you? He could give you what you're asking for. Like it's a part, like he could give you the thing. So say you're pushing against God's leadership in your life and you're like, no, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna kind of do this thing. Many times the worst possible thing could be that God could actually give it to you. Uh, Paul says this, Romans, he's writing to his church, to the church at Rome. And uh, he says this, Romans 1, 24 and 26. And uh, Paul is laying out uh, these kind of the guilt of the world, the rebellious ways they're living. It says, therefore, God delivered them over to the desires of their hearts. It says to sexual impurity so that their bodies are degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served, what has been created instead of the creator who is praised forever. So, so Paul just says in, the, in chapter one of, of Romans, God gave them exactly what they wanted. And we, and we talked about this, right? That for some people, the worst possible thing could be to succeed in life. Because they go, God, I don't want you. And the psalmist says, right, I, I see the things of the world around me, and I feel burdened. They feel like everything's going well for them until I enter the sanctuary of the Father. And so God says, I'm, I'm not going to go with you. So what does Moses do, right? Moses now has a choice in front of him. Let's see what he does. Exodus 33, 1 through 4. Uh, it says, the Lord spoke to um, the Lord spoke to Moses, go up from here and the people you brought with you. And he, he lays out this whole thing and says, I'm not going to go with you. This is not what I'm going to, um, this is not what I'm going to do. Now it's fascinating. Here, here's the part that I want to highlight in this because it's really interesting what happens here. Notice in verse one, he says, go. And then in verse two, in verse two and three, he says, what does he say about the land? He says what? I'm going to give you the land. So he says, I'm not going with you, but I'm going to give you the land. So, so 
He's going to give you what is promised. He's going to give you the gift, but not, he's not going to give him himself. Now, the question is, if you could get everything that you wanted from God, but you didn't have God, would you be happy? If God would give you everything that you asked of him, but he would not give you himself, would you be happy? Because God says to them, I'm going to give you the gift, but I'm not going to give you myself. And, and so they, they have this kind of choice in front of them, right? They can have the, the kingdom without the king. And what, what does Moses know? Moses knows that possession without presence isn't enough. Possession without presence is not enough. We cannot say yes to the presence that flow from God and yet say no to the presence of God. It's an important question for ourselves. So what did Moses do? Uh, did, he, did Moses go, man, that's great. Give us a land. He would looked, uh, Moses would have looked awesome as a leader. He'd be like, hey, guys, guess what? We're going, uh, God, um, based on my leadership, uh, we're going to have an angel that's going to go through the land and clear that sucker out for us. And we're going we're gonna to take the land. So let's charge ahead. Moses could have done that. Would have looked awesome from a worldly leadership standpoint. Would have looked awesome. He could have said, all right, let's go, let's go do this thing. Uh, but that's not what he does. Moses says, we want you. And if we can't have you, we won't move an inch. Exodus 33, verse 7, it says, Now Moses took a tent, pitched outside the camp at the distance. And this is the tent of meeting that we looked, out, looked at earlier. It says, When anyone wanted to consult with the Lord, they went to the tent of meeting, right? And then he kind of lays out in Exodus 33, 7 through 11. It kind of uh, lays out this pillar of cloud would come. And Moses, they would, they would kind of speak together. And then verse 11, it says, The Lord, verse 11, Exodus 33, The Lord would speak with Moses face to face, just as a man speaks with his friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. His assistant, the young man Joshua, son of Nun, would leave, uh, would not leave the inside of the tent. Just two thoughts, just brief thoughts, not about the sermon this morning. Uh, tent of the meeting that Moses sets up. Do you know what that is? That is a place of prayer. Do you know why we prioritize, we say it all the time, the reason we prioritize prayer is because we prioritize the presence of God. And Moses says, if we're going to experience the blessings and the promise of God, we got to set up a tent because we need the presence of God. And so it says he would go into the tent and they would talk as if a friend, like face to face as a friend in this tent of meaning, a tent of prayer. The second thing I want to draw your attention to is verse 11, second part of verse 11. We are introduced to Moses' assistant at the bottom part of 11. Do you see that? It says his assistant, the young man, Joshua, son of Nun, would not leave the inside of the tent. Now, what do we know about Joshua? Joshua becomes an incredible leader for Israel, does he not? If you, if you know the Bible, I don't want to ruin it for you. But uh, what we know about Joshua is Joshua ends up doing what? He ends up le actually leading the people into the promised land after the wilderness experience of the people. So there's 40 years in the wilderness and then they're led through, right? So Joshua is going to be the guy who leads them through. What does the text tell us about Joshua? Does Joshua become an incredible leader and receives the blessings of God because of his leadership traits? Was he a strong military kind of guy? Maybe. Maybe he was a great leader. You know what we know about Joshua? We know Joshua didn't want to leave the tent of meeting. Joshua, at a young age, was sowing seeds in his youth that he would reap years later as a leader for the people of Israel. And Joshua just said, I do not want to leave the tent because I love the presence of God. He was obsessed with the presence of God. And it's just like a little side note there. 
So Moses says, no, we, we're not going anywhere. Verse 12, Exodus 33, it says, Moses said to the Lord, look, you've told me, lead these people up, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. You said, I know you by name, and you also found favor with me. Now, if indeed you found favor, now indeed, now if I have indeed found favor with you, please teach me your ways, and I will know you so that I may find favor with you. Now consider that this nation is your people. Moses is like, these are your people. This is your son. Verse 14, he replied, look what God says to him. My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses says, if your presence does not go, Moses responded, do not make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favor with you unless you go with us? I and your people, listen to this, I and your people will be distinguished by this from all the other people on the face of the earth. What distinguishes and differentiates God's people from everyone else? It's an obsession with the presence of God. Moses says, what will differentiate us from everyone else? If you don't go with us, we are just like everyone else. How will anyone know we're any different if we don't have your presence? Moses says, you have to go with us. You have to. Moses had walked with God long enough at this point that he refuses to go without the manifest presence of God. One theologian, uh, Trapp, says it this way. He says, this hunger for more of God, for more of an experience with God, is a mark of true revival and restoration of relationship. Whatever Moses had experienced with God, he now wanted more. There, uh, the more a man knows of God, the more desirous he is to know him. Exodus 33, 17 through 23. So Moses is like, man, we gotta, I gotta have you. We need your presence. This is what's gonna differentiate us from everyone else. What is God's response? Verse 17, it says, the Lord answered Moses, I will do this very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor with me, and I know you by name. Verse 18, then Moses said, uh, please let me see your glory. And if you're reading this text enough, you're like, this Moses dude is pressing, right? I'd have been like, oh, good, all right, let's go. Moses is like, can I please see your glory? Verse 19 he said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name, the Lord, before you. I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I will have compassion on who I'm have compassion. Verse 20, he's going to answer this question about, can I see your glory? He says, you cannot see my face. Now, it's fascinating. We don't have time to get into it. God did not ask to see the face of God, but the glory of God, and God said, I can't show you my face. He says, for humans cannot see me and live. Can you imagine that? If God would have shown Moses his glory and just killed him. Anyways. So God says, I can't. I'll, I'll blast you, dude. I can't do that. But he says, verse 22 or 21, he says, the Lord said, here, stand in this place. Uh, here is a place near me. Uh, you're to stand in the rock. And when my glory passes by, I'll put you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand, that's amazing, until I pass by, verse 23, then I'll take my hand away and you'll see my back, but my face will not be seen. So simple this morning. What is God's response to Moses' plea for his presence? So simple this morning. Uh, my, my, my friend John Tyson says it this way. God comes where he's wanted. You, you want to experience the, the presence of God, the, the blessing and the, the favor of God. God comes where he's wanted. That's, where he, that's the secret. That's the secret sauce. A.W. Tozer writes this, I want to deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought our present low state. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of our spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad 
and that with many of us he waits so long, so very long in vain. And so God says, I'll go with you. I'll lead you. You, you, you want me, I will bring my leadership. If you want to know a prayer that always pleases the heart of God, this is a prayer that always pleases his heart. Very simple. God, I want to experience more of you. Would you give me more of yourself? I want to experience you more deeply. It's a prayer that warms the heart of God. This is our desire. This is what we want. I quite, quite frequently find myself uh, walking around on the streets uh, at my home, in my relationships, inside of this office during the week, just saying to God, God, you are welcome here. God, we want you here. We want you in this city. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. You're welcome here. You're what, God, you're welcome here. This is what we want. This is the role. This is the work that Moses is seeking to do. Okay. It's fascinating here. I just want to highlight something for us. With Moses here, you know what role Moses is playing here? Do you know what he's doing in this moment? Uh, he's actually done this before. We see it in Exodus 32. But Moses here is playing the role of what? Of intercessor. And he's interceding on behalf of the people. See, the people as a whole, their, their actions or behavior was not characteristic of a people who what? Wanted the presence of God. They're openly rebelling and they're pressing against his leadership. And Moses says what? He says, I'm going to intercede on their behalf. Now, just two quick thoughts here. One is, is kind of a, a personal implication thought, and then one of them is a bit kind of Christocentric, bigger kind of thought here. So let me give you the practical one first. We should be the type of people, we should be like a Moses, interceding, right, on behalf of our friends, our coworkers, inside of our church. Like, we, we should be seeking to play the role that, that Moses is playing. We should be asking more and more. Father, we want to experience you more. God, help us. Help our church experience you more. Our group, our house church, we want to experience you more. Just on a very practical level, on the streets, should we be playing that role? Should we not? We, we have it in front of us. Second thing that's really fascinating, so, so we can work this kind of, we, we want to look at Moses and go, man, I want to be like that. But we, but we also would, would miss something very deep here. We talked about it last week. There was a, a foreshadowing that was happening at the end of the Genesis story narrative, remember? Where God says to the serpent, uh, one is coming in the line of a woman who will kill you. It was a gospel proclamation, right? Um, I will give you a better clothing. It's a foreshadowing of what Christ would do in the New Testament. It was motivated by the love of the Father. But we also see there, Christ is also in, in the text here when it comes to the work that Moses is doing. Uh, their future is bleak. And what the Israelites deserve is the punishment of God. Do they not? They deserve the punishment of God for their wickedness. And Moses steps in and he makes a way forward. This comes from Exodus 32, 30 and 32. He's been doing this multiple times. It says the following day, uh, Moses said to the people, you have committed a grave sin. This is when they made the calf. Now I will go up to the Lord. And look what he says. Perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. Moses like, I will go into the presence of God and maybe I can atone for your sin. Verse 31, it says, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, oh, these people have committed a grave sin. They have made a God of gold for themselves. Now, now listen to this. Verse 32. Now, if you would only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from the book that you have written. So Moses says, man, I'm laying it all on the line for these people. And if you destroy them, then just wipe me off the face of the earth. God's already said, let's start again. I'll start with you, Moses. I'll start again. I'll start with you. Moses is like, nope. We know in the New Testament we have one who intercedes on our behalf, Paul, to the church at Rome. And then I'll close Romans 8, verse 34. 
It says, who is the one that condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. And then he's going to tell us, Paul's going to tell us positionally, not just positionally where Christ is, but what Christ is doing in that position. He says he also is at the right hand of God and he intercedes for us. We are people like the Israelites who deserve, because of our rebellion and wickedness, we deserve the punishment of God. And the scriptures tell us that the Son of God, through his life, death, and resurrection, is not just seated on the throne, but is interceding on your behalf. This is the God that we have. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. God, we desire more of your presence. Would you give us a, a greater portion of who you are? Would you build us into a people, a church, and individuals who desire your presence above a possession of anything else. God, we need your help. I pray for my brothers and sisters in the room uh, who perhaps because of their circumstances or their expectations, maybe their desires have, have kept your leadership from their life. God, would it break free this morning? Would they see the, the kindness and the goodness of who you are, that you're out in front of them that you care for them, that you can be trusted. God, we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.